In chapter two, we're going to be looking at the birth of a nation. We're going to be looking at the birth of the United States. Um, we're uh, looking at the end of colonialism as a whole and our reasonings for breaking free of Great Britain. Okay, so 2.1 itself is um, the American Revolution. And the first thing that we're going to look at are the causes. Um, and there's a huge list of events that I've given you in your notes. It's that big chart. So we're going to look at each one of these. And I have it set up to where what it is. Um, that's the one that would go in that middle colony. And its importance. Now, if you have what it is and its importance kind of back and forth mixed up, it's fine as long as you know pretty much what that event is and, and what it leads to. Um, I also have the year. Um, all of these are put in order. Um, so there may have been a little bit of, may not have all matched up in your text, but that's okay. <clears throat> so let's begin with the French and Indian War. Now the French and Indian War is a part of a larger conflict. Um, it is a conflict between Britain and France. Um, and it actually, and, and it's over colonial territory, um, but in Britain it's known as the Seven Years War, and here we call it the French and Indian War. Um, but they're fighting over land and resources, um, the land being North America, um, and, and all of the resources that you can see here. Uh, this is a very rich area in natural resources. And, um, and we'll talk about mercantilism later, but, you know, Whoever controls those resources and that land has the money, all right? Um, the French and Indian War is ironically enough begun by George Washington, um, who sent to Fort Duquesne to um, expel the French. Um, he is defeated, um, but that begins the actual fighting in America. Um, the war is France and her Indian allies versus Britain and her Indian allies. Um, Americans are British citizens, so they're going to fight with um, the Redcoats. So as we go through this war, um, initially the French were winning. Uh, that was due to their Indian allies um, until uh, Pitt, uh, the Prime Minister of Britain, decides that we need Indian allies, and so that's going to turn the tide of the war. Um, at the end of the day, the British win the French and Indian War. France is going to surrender, and they're going to give up all of their claims in um, Canada and all the lands east of the Mississippi River. So British territory is going to be greatly increased um, at this time. For as great as that is, <clears throat> it's going to lead to a lot of tension between British and the American colonists. Um, this war was expensive. And if you think about government and how it covers expenses, uh, probably the first thing that you think of is taxes. So they're going to have to kind of begin to, to raise that revenue uh, to pay for the war and what they see as the defense of the colonies too. And it's not just raising taxes. It's also enforcing um, laws that they'd already written, uh, like the Navigation Acts. And here we can see what we had been. This was British territory prior to um, the Treaty of Paris of 1763, which ended, and this is going to be the disputed land. Um, it's around in this area out here in the Ohio River Valley uh, where the war began. Um, but look at what we come to after the treaty. Look at how much land and territory is gained by Great Britain. And this is probably a bigger look at it. Um, and then the colonies, look at the space that the colonies inhabit. Um, this is going to become a point of contention, just to understand. Um, but also, even though we don't really talk a lot about Spain, pay attention to that because that's going to we're going to um, have some conflict with Spain later. Um, here's all France is left with way down there um, and a little bit up there with their fishing rights. So this was a huge loss um, for France. This is uh, a political cartoon that most of you know um, about. Uh, this, is, this was drawn by uh, Benjamin Franklin, and it was in 1754. So this is a Revolutionary War era um, cartoon. But Basically, he's telling the colonists that they need to unite or they won't survive. 
okay? Not unite against Britain, but to unite to fight together against France. Um, we will see this, of course, come back up um, within a couple of decades, well, within a decade or two, um, as we move toward the revolution. Okay. Next to our writs of assistance, um, these were written in about 1760, um, and these are general search warrants that allowed the British authorities to search whatever they wanted for whatever reason. Um, they're not specific. Um, they have a search warrant to search a ship because they think it's carrying goods that are considered contraband or being smuggled. Um, it, essentially, this is enforcing the Navigation Acts, which had been written um, in the 1600s and were rarely enforced. Um, understand that the Navigation Acts kind of was there to ensure economic loyalty to Britain. Um, you not, and we had this last chapter, I had you look that term up, the Navigation Acts. Um, the Navigation Acts essentially said that um, English ships with English sailors could trade with English colonies. In, in other words, the, the British colonists were not allowed to trade with France or with Spain or with Portugal or with any other country, just England. Okay, and this is a part of mercantilism also. Um, but, but this is what the writs of assistance were used for. It was to enforce that. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at the Stamp Act. Um, now, the Stamp Act is the big one. Um, this is kind of what got everything moving um, in the direction of revolution. It's where we begin to see the colonists um, coming together, uh, uniting, not for independence initially, but in protest. Okay, so the Stamp Act was passed in 1765 by Parliament. And it taxed nearly all printed material by requiring a government stamp, um, a land deed, a marriage license, um, a deck of cards, um, any kind of legal document, um, you know, newspapers, pamphlets, these kind of things had to have that government stamp. Now, the purpose here was to have colonists help pay off the war debt and to cont contribute toward uh, their defense, but, but they weren't seeing it that way. Um, the Americans are not taxed as much as the British, and so the British Parliament was like, hey, well, let's, let's tax them some. Their problem was that they didn't have represent, representation in Parliament, and Parliament th therefore could not tax them. Think back to Magna Carta and English Bill of Rights. That's where this no taxation without representation comes from. Uh, we we have to, to, for you to tax us, for the government to tax us, we have to have representatives in government. Now, they're not asking for representatives in Parliament. Their point is we have our own legislative assemblies and they tax us. Um, so there was the major issue there. Um, not that they're being taxed, but that they didn't have representation. Um, so again, the no taxation without representation it is going to come to the fore here. Probably not the smartest thing, but the British also set it up to where um, it wouldn't take effect for a year. So that gave the Americans a whole year to plan protests. And um, one of those was a boycott. Um, boycotts aren't always successful, um, but here was an extremely successful boycott. A lot of it has to do with the fact that they're only buying British goods. So, you know, if, if they quit buying too much British goods, too many British goods, then it's going to be felt in Britain. And it was. So you see the development of the Sons of Liberty, and they're going to enforce those boycotts. Now, if, if you're buying British goods, and they know you are, they're going to attack you in some way. Um, they're going to destroy your business. They're going to intimidate you. They are, I mean, and it's mob violence here. Um, so we're not talking like one man against, you know, another man. We're talking about a mob of people and getting everybody else upset. And they're going to attack you in public, but also, you know, at night with a torch. OK, 
Okay, um, so they were using that violence and intimidation to prevent the implementation of this specific British law, the Stamp Act. And of course, the boycotts and violence led to the repeal of the Stamp Act the next year. So <clears throat> it was repealed in, in 1766. But now at the same time, understand that kind of leads us to the Declaratory Act. Um, Parliament states, yeah, we'll, we'll repeal it, but Parliament has the authority to impose laws on the colonies and taxes regardless. Um, so the importance here was England telling the colonists that you have to follow British laws whether you feel like you are represented or not. Okay. This is by the way a um, great depiction of, uh, of tarring and feathering um, of someone who actually had gone against the um, boycott. Um, this is a liberty tree, which is irony. Um, y there you have your noose. Again, the irony of a noose on a liberty tree. Stamp Act is upside down, forcing tea down his throat. Um, and you'll notice that they're carrying clubs. And if you look at their faces, they just look, these are the patriots. These are the sons of liberty. These are the Americans. And, and they just look dishonest. So um, this would be an example of British propaganda there. Okay, next is the Boston Massacre, um, one that we've all heard of. Uh, this occurred on March 5th, 1770. And um, this is when British soldiers fired shots into a crowd of colonists, um, killing several. It led to, well, I think five were killed. Um, it's going to lead to stories being spread throughout the colonies, angering a lot of uh, people against the British. And if you look here, um, this was drawn by Paul Revere. And, and look, you've got a very organized group of British soldiers standing there. You've got Captain Prescott standing behind him with his sword raised. You know he's yelling fire. Um, and, and you've got an unorganized mob, not mob, but an unorganized crowd of colonists here just standing there minding their own business uh, and, and of course you've got blood and the dog here references the the rumor that went around that you know there was so much blood that that dogs were l lapping at the blood in the street um it's beneath butchers hall kind of calling them butchers uh, this is an example whereas the stamp act one was an example of british propaganda this is an excellent example of american propaganda okay um and the truth of the matter is that these, this mob, and they were a mob, they were yelling and throwing stones. And um, it was at night, it was like nine o'clock at night. And Prescott did not order anyone to fire. What probably happened is that one of the mob yelled fire. And so a British soldier fired into the crowd. What was also not discussed really was the fact that um, they were arrested. The British soldiers were arrested, including Prescott, and they are going to face trial. Uh, John Adams is going to represent them, and he's going to manage to get them acquitted. It was an amazing um, feat, and it also shows the importance that, that people like John Adams put that um, in one of our core principles, uh, the idea that everyone deserves a fair trial. Okay. <clears throat> um, next, we had the Boston Tea Party, and, and here you had um, colonists throwing tea into the Boston Harbor in protest of the Tea Act. Now, the Tea Act essentially gave the um, Dutch East India Tea Company a monopoly. Um, it wasn't that you had to pay, everybody had to pay a tax on all tea. It was if you weren't the Dutch East India Tea Company, you had to pay a tax there was a tax on your tea so the only tax the only tea that wasn't taxed um was this preferred company out of out of england and so the people didn't like that because people who weren't selling their tea um were having to sell it at a higher price and you think about which one you'd rather have high quality um tea at a low price or a higher price so it it, it was hurting business so um, a group of, again, the Sons of Liberty are going to dress up like Indians. They're going to aboard ships and they're going to throw it into the Boston Harbor. That said, 
there were also several other tea parties throughout the colonies, um, including one in Charleston. Um, the British weren't going to take this uh, lightly. Uh, and so Parliament's going to pass the Intolerable Acts, also known as the Coercive Acts. Now, I, I put both names here. I call them the Intolerable Acts, but a lot of times it is in a book or it's going to might be on a test or in a cartoon or something as or in a, any kind of source as a Coercive Acts. Um, both of these are negative. Both of these are American names for it. This is not what the um, British called them. There's another picture of them throwing tea in there. By the way, they didn't dress as Indians to blame the Indians. Um, a lot of reasons going on there. One, well, we don't want people to know who's really doing it. Um, the Intolerable Acts. Um, there were four parts to the Intolerable Acts. Four. Don't You don't need to know all of them. The big ones here that caused most of the tension is one, it closed Boston Harbor. Listen, this is where particularly New England, uh, specifically Massachusetts, this is this was important to their economy. And so when you close the harbor, no ships get out, none get in, unless, of course, it's a military ship. So no trade is going on. Um, and this is going to lead several of our founding fathers to experience real economic hardship during this time. Um, it also is, they're also going to put a military governor over Massachusetts. Another word for this is martial law. Um, they're going to suspend the legislature, the, the uh, Colonial Assembly in Massachusetts. And you've got a military leader who, who can make any law he wants to. So, again, denying them their rights. Um, and so the colonists are going to form the First Continental Congress. If you kind of make this bigger, you can see again the forceful pouring of tea. Um, this is the um, port bill, and so they're pouring something like that. They're pouring something forcefully down the throat of a colonist. Um, In addition to that, I mean, you can look around, and you can see the British kind of standing there. Uh, Liberty kind of has a hand over her eyes. Um, you've got military law standing there. So, First Continental Congress met in September of 1774, and it was formed in response to the Intolerable Acts. Um, they wrote to the king that the colonists had a right to be represented in their government. Um, and since they were not represented in, um, in Parliament, they were entitled to rule themselves. As you can imagine, that did not go over very well. Um, it did not really solve any problems. <clears throat> Britain didn't wake up and go, oh, hey, you know, maybe they have a point. Uh, it, it was important that you did see the colonists coming together and acting in concert. And think back to that snake, that disjointed snake that Ben Franklin had drawn. Here you have them finally joining together. They are not yet asking for independence. Okay, that's still two years down the road. All right. Speaking of two years, let's jump ahead to 1776. Um, in January of that year, uh, Common Sense was published. Now, it was published anonymously, you see, written by an Englishman. Um, in reality, it was Thomas Paine. Um, the reason it's going to be anonymous is this would have been considered seditious, and he would have been uh, arrested, tried, and probably hung. So it was probably good for him to not sign his name. But in this, this is, a, this is just a pamphlet. It's not a book, uh, but it's, it's a very long essay, I guess you could say. But he made a very compelling case for independence. And it's important because it's going to convince many people to join the cause for independence. Uh, again, no one is, well, some in New England, but very few are actually um, convinced that independence is, is needed at this point. So um, just understand, you want a persuasive essay, read Common Sense and see what that was about. This was an amazing piece of work. Um, just before that, and I put those a little bit out of order Sorry about that. Uh, we have Lexington and Concord. Um, remember the British 
military governor, um, he is going to order the British troops to Concord because there's a rumor that there are weapons being stockpiled to use against um, the British. Uh, so the army is going to take off and they get to Lexington and they're going to be attacked by colonial militiamen. Um, initially, there was, um, it was, it was almost a joke. You have about 70. Excuse me, you have about 70 um, Minutemen confronting the British Army. Um, they're pretty much going to be told, go home. They do, or they at least leave there. Um, the Army is going to go to Concord. Uh, when they get to Concord, the barn is empty. You know, everybody knew they were coming, so they, they cleared everything out. So the Army turns around and comes back. On the way back through Lexington, they are met by a larger crowd of um, Minutemen, about 1,100 or so, and they're going to fire shots. They are going to end up killing quite a few of the British, wounding many others, um, and the British are going to have to retreat. So the first shots of the American Revolution are fired in Lexington. Um, it's also known as the shot heard around the world, um, and also it was a great victory for the Americans. Uh, just after that, the Second Continental Congress is going to meet. They are going to meet to discuss how to deal with the situation of Lexington and Concord. Um, Got to do something. You know, we fired on the uh, on the British. They're, they're going to want to retaliate. And understand that, again, initially, you see, this is May of 1775, still not ready for independence. Um, they're going to write an olive branch petition, um, kind of, I don't want to say asking for forgiveness, but kind of, let's put it, let's get back on an even footing. Um, that's not going to go over well. And so what they end up doing the next year in 1776 is drafting the Declaration of Independence. Um, and here you can see the difference between the two, and um, you can read over that as you have time. So let's look at the Declaration. Um, the Declaration, of course, was written by Thomas Jefferson, who was greatly influenced by John Locke and the Enlightenment. And, and the Enlightenment was uh, big on egalitarianism and John Locke, of course, with inalienable rights. So it's influenced by Locke and the Enlightenment, and it's based on the principles of egalitarianism and inalienable rights. Uh, remember, egalitarianism means equality. That's one of your terms, as is inalienable rights. Um, Jefferson um, is, is going to conclude, in the and he makes an amazing this list that you see in the Declaration essentially means this. Is, it comes down to this. He concludes that the colonies had the right to declare independence because Great Britain had failed its duty excuse me, had failed in its duty to uphold the people's natural rights. And this is the social contract theory that we looked at in Chapter 1. Um, so, you know, English Bill of Rights had said no illegal searches and seizures. There you go. Um, we, we have them with these writs of assistance. Um, you have the right to bear arms with the English Bill of Rights, but again, you know, trying to take away their guns. Um, no taxation without representation in both Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights. So the list is long. Um, and again, this is a lot of propaganda. Um, it's a great document. It's a great essay. Um, a lot of the things that he blames the king for, that, that Jefferson blames the king for, was the doing of parliament. And he's focusing on the king because he wants people to blame one person. It's easier to blame the president than who's one man than, than 535 members of Congress. Okay, For the same reason, it's easier to blame the king instead of all of parliament. So that's what this argument is. Um, I don't have it on here, but it's important to, to, to think about who was this written for? It was written to the king, but who is the real intended audience? 
And the real intended audience of the Declaration of Independence was the people of America. Um, it, it, just like common sense was persuasive, so was this. It was meant to persuade. That's why he's blaming the king. Um, a few instances of Parliament, but that's why he's blaming the king. He's trying to turn Americans, those who are still on the fence and haven't decided um, one side or the other which side to support, he's trying to sever that tie between the people and the king. And I would say overall, not 100%, but overall, he was very, very successful. Now, the Declaration of Independence is um, important to us. It greatly impacts us immediately after it was written, but also um, into modern times. It doesn't just impact us, but it's impacted the world. Okay? Um, immediate, the immediate impact was that the states... The colonies, as soon as it was signed, became states. They're going to draft their state constitutions. Those state constitutions usually included a Bill of Rights, and they were mostly based on the principles and ideas that were found in the Declaration. Um, I'm going to skip a little ahead here. We're going to come back to this, but go to D. Um, even though this is a great document, even though it states things like all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with the, the rights, the liberty or life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Even though it says that, our government denied that to groups of people. OK, specifically, they the government supports slavery, which denies liberty to African-Americans. Um, Native Americans were denied citizenship um, and any of the rights that go with that. Um, women are denied the right to vote, thus they're not represented either in Congress. So you, you see that even though we have this belief, we don't extend it to everyone. And so for that reason, we consider this an unfulfilled promise. Now, if we go back to B, this brings up um, the future actions. Um, you think in D, who all has been denied um, that equality and it denied their natural rights and representation? Uh, but, but look in B. One of the great things about America is we, we don't stay the same and we constantly strive to um, reform and to to improve we may not always make it but but we there's we do strive to do so and so the declaration for many many years is is going to be used um, as a foundation for future reform movements specifically the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement you could even go so far as to say um, for the civil war um, for those who fought to end slavery okay so great impact on us socially um, for the next two centuries. Um, and finally, see, we look at how did it impact other countries. Now, um, the only real one you need to know is the French Revolution, um, but, but our uh, Declaration of Independence is going to inspire the French to write the Declaration of Rights of Man and of the Citizen. Um, and it also leads um, them to begin their own revolution, um, the French Revolution. Now, I'm not going to say that it is anything like ours. It was very violent, and it got that way very quickly, and it stayed that way for a long time. Um, and it was much bloodier than ours. They actually end up uh, killing, executing not just the king, but the king's family. So very bloody affair compared to ours. Okay, but, but both the revolution and the declaration very much impacted them. Okay. All right, so let's look at the American Revolutionary War. Listen, a lot of things went on. Um, there were a lot of battles. Um, the whole um, the whole war in the South was great and and awesome. And and probably even though when we've studied it in the past, we always focus on the New York area. We focus on what's going on up north. But the majority of the war was fought in the South. Okay, and 
kind of oddly enough, right here you get um, this battle is, you know, Saratoga's in New York, but, you know, um, the final surrender is going to come at Yorktown. So let's look at um, the Battle of Saratoga and its significance, okay? Um, it's important because for the first time, now we've won some battles up to this point, but they've been small, okay? Not our full army um, across the field from their full army, but Saratoga was, and we won. And so it convinced the French that the U.S. could win this war. So the French and the U.S. forged, forged an alliance. There's a word missing there that should say alliance. Um, and they gave us money. Um, they gave us, uh, they sent some advisors, uh, primarily looking at the Marquis de Lafayette. Um, they sent ships of, say, uh, ships of uh, soldiers. So they gave us a big help. Okay. Now, I'm not saying it because they loved us and loved liberty. They did it because they hated the British. But hey, we'll take what we can get, right? Um, and then the end of the war, um, the last battle is the Battle of Yorktown in Virginia. Again, French helped us out there. They have them um, uh, trapped um, at the sea. Uh, you got the Southern Army coming from the South and you've got the Northern Army coming. So we had them surrounded. They surrendered. And even though the war is fought for another couple of years. It is essentially over, but it doesn't officially end until the Treaty of Paris of 1783. Um, and that's the official end to the American Revolutionary War. And Britain formally recognized U.S. independence and ceded, ceded means gave to us, um, the U.S. gave to the U.S. British territory east of the Mississippi River, um, not Florida, that belonged to Spain, um, and also south of Canada. All right, so that's done. We're done with the Revolutionary War. We're done with what leads up to it. So next, let's look at our terms. Um, some of these were hard to find in your book. I understand that. Um, sometimes the book gave an okay definition, um, and I added to it. In some cases, not in all, but in some cases, just because um, when we, as we look at it throughout. So make note of the changes. Don't erase what you have. Just kind of add out to the side any changes you need to make. A mercantilism is the economic system of the time. And under this theory, countries grow wealthier and maintain their national security by maintaining a favorable balance of trade. And that's one where they export more than they import. And they do this by obtaining colonies for resources and markets. Um, and this system encourages colonialization and it discourages colonial manufacturing. Um, we're the colonies, so we send them raw materials. They manufacture the raw materials and then they sell the finished good to us. They don't make any money if we're buying the good, if we're making um, the goods from the natural resources and then buying it. We, we need to buy it from them. Um, for them to make the money, okay? And then they will sell it, not us. They will sell it to France and to Spain. Um, they don't want any other country directly dealing with us, and that was the reason for the Navigation Acts. Egalitarianism is, is equality. We see this in um, the Declaration. All men are created equal. Again, even though we don't live up to that, the idea is there, and you can see the belief is there. Um, although there's some irony that um, a slaveholder believed that, and he did, um, but you, you don't see it in the way he lives. He also believed, and this is John Locke's idea, but, but penned by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration, um, inalienable rights are natural rights people are born with and that government cannot take away. According to Jefferson, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, according to Locke, life, liberty, and property. A loyalist um, during the revolution is one who remained loyal to the king. And a patriot is a colonist that supported independence. Okay. Um, a confederation is a form of government in which each state... Excuse me. A confederation is one in which each, um, excuse me, a form of government in which each state would maintain its sovereignty while being loosely unified as a nation. Um, this is a strong state government and a weak central government. Um, and this is was solely based on the idea that they feared a strong central government. 
because of Britain. You have a king and a strong parliament, and they ran over our rights. So we want the state governments to be the most powerful. Okay. Um, separation of powers, which we'll talk about when we get to the comp Constitution. Um, each branch shares government authority, branches being executive, legislative, and judicial. They share authority. Checks and balances are um, set up to make sure that no one branch tries to use its authority to overpower the others. Each branch has powers that will check the power of another branch. Congress makes the laws, but the president can veto. But Congress can also override that veto with enough um, votes. So there's ways to keep the president from becoming a king or a dictator or Congress from overruling um, or just overriding all of us, uh, much like what we had seen Parliament do. Um, federalism, uh, two levels of government. This is an upper and a lower. National government goes up top and state governments um, below. Power is shared between them, okay? Um, and we'll look more at that when we get to um, 2.4. Judicial review. Um, this is the court's power to declare acts of Congress and or state legislatures unconstitutional. We have, um, they have this power because of the court case uh, Marbury versus Madison. A tariff is a tax on imports. And a republic, now again, this is one of those specifically that it says Republican government. And I changed this around. I think this is an, a better way of saying it. Hopefully it makes um, better sense than what the book said. Even though power rests with the people, um, they elect a group of people which represents them um, in government. They govern in their place. We don't have a direct democracy. We have a democratic republic. Um, the people still hold the power, but we elect representatives and they rule in our stead. Okay, so we'll look more at that later. Okay, if you have any questions, please write your questions down. Come talk to me. Um, you can ask the question in class or you can come and ask me um, by yourself. Okay, thank you.